On the outskirts of Natick, Massachusetts, a small concrete structure rises out of the hillside. The exterior door of this structure has been pulled down by a front loader, and the entryway is filled with skeletons. Within lies a story of greed, revenge, and death in darkness. I'm the resident cartographer, and this is the story of what happened at the Boston Mayoral Shelter. To properly discuss the events of the shelter, I think we need to start with a full understanding of its layout. The surface level entrance of the shelter is a standard reinforced concrete bunker entrance one can find across the Commonwealth and even as far away as Appalachia. The door restricting access was controlled via a security terminal housed in the booth overlooking the entrance. After having passed through the exterior door, there is a second door that separates the entrance from the subterranean section of the shelter. Beyond this door lies a rough-hewn tunnel that splits in two before rejoining at the base of a pair of staircases in a room with brick columns. Following this path further leads to a security checkpoint. Beyond the security checkpoint lies an elevator that grants access to the lower levels. The first thing encountered in the lower level is a hallway that leads to another security station. Beyond this final security station, one reaches the residential section. This section is composed of a dining area, a den, a lounge, a kitchen, storage, a laundry room, three bedrooms, three bathrooms, a utility room, a rec room, and an attached locker room. Along with this, there's a secret escape tunnel that connects the back of the rec room to the hall just past the elevator. Alright, that said, let's get into the story of what happened here. As the war between the Communist Chinese and the United States worsened in the 2070s, it was becoming more and more apparent that the war was likely to turn nuclear. Across the country, people were looking for places to ride out the bombs. While some were invited into vault tech vaults, and some families built their own shelters. In Boston, Mayor Hildenbrand used the power of his office to build his family a bunker. This bunker, known as the Boston Mayoral Shelter, was no mere fallout shelter. Mrs. Hildenbrand had a laundry list of demands, and her dutiful husband did everything he could to ensure those demands were met. A family man through and through, there was nothing the mayor wouldn't do for his wife and kids. Of course, this meant that the shelter would be an expensive undertaking, and the funds for it came straight out of the public coffers. Not only would the mayor's family live with the comforts of the pre-war, but they would be looked after by a staff of over a dozen, including guards, doctors, and attendants. The extravagant spending on the shelter wasn't a secret, and the public wasn't happy. This wouldn't be the only scandal in the run-up to the war. In October 2077, Mayor Hildenbrand had ordered the installation of Protectron guards in the historic Faneuil Hall against the wishes of the local merchants. These Protectrons ended up killing seven Bostonians that were caught up in a shoplifting incident. In the end though, it was the lavish spending on the family bunker, not the accidental killing spree that would cost him the most. On the morning of Saturday, October 23rd, 2077, the civil defense sirens announced the arrival of the New World. The mayor's family and staff managed to get to the bunker unscathed, but they were soon followed there by an angry mob. When Mayor Hildenbrand refused to open the door, the mob became riotous and began to beat their way in. The mayor's guards did what they could to fight back against the rioters, but they were outnumbered. Using a front loader, the mob pulled down the front door and advanced into the entryway. The guards could do nothing but slow the mob down, and the attackers were soon just outside the gate of the first security station. In the lower levels, the mayor was panicking. He knew it was just a matter of time until they butchered him and his family. He locked himself in the bathroom and recorded a goodbye message for his wife, telling her to give his body to the mob and to tell them that he had died a coward. He had hoped that this would be enough to get the rioters to back down. He downed the majority of a six-pack for courage and climbed into the tub with his radio. When one of his aides found him, he left him there and relocked the door, figuring that he needed to shield the mayor's wife from the tragedy. The aide then brought the mayor's wife and children to the utility room where they hid, hoping to wait out the worst of it. Here, the mayor's wife recorded a message for her husband, apologizing for the extravagance she requested, saying that they didn't need it all. All they needed was each other. Like her husband, her skeleton can be found within the shelter. That said, the skeletons of her children cannot, so we can hope that they escaped the mob's wrath. It doesn't seem to be the case that the mob seized the shelter and used it for themselves, but it does seem likely that they took what food they could from the shelter's storage. Anyway, we don't know much of the story of the shelter of the next 210 years, other than that it was, for some reason, 
a target of the Institute. In 2287, the sole survivor of Vault 111 visited the old shelter and found it under the control of Jin 1 and Jin 2 synths. Why the Institute was interested in the site isn't obvious. I can only guess that the Institute may have searched the shelter for useful tech or information and just left the old synths behind as a trap should the railroad attempt to use the shelter as a base of operations. Along with this, one of the walls of the rec room has been destroyed by a tunneling deathclaw. Regardless of this, the shelter was a target for scavenging, assassination, and kill missions from the various factions controlling the Commonwealth at that time. That's about all I could find on the story of the Boston Mayoral Shelter, but before closing things out, I have a few notes. First, I was originally disinclined to believe that Mayor Hildenbrand's sacrifice would have saved his wife and children. I thought this wasn't just revenge, but that the mob also wanted the shelter. Then I realized that they didn't keep the shelter. There's no sign that the mob stayed after they won. The pantry is drained of food, but the rest of the shelter is well stocked. All the locked storage is still full. Skeletons still litter the floor, meaning that bodies once littered the floor, unmoved by any potential residents. It seems that they won, that they took what they could and they left. While it does seem likely that they killed the mayor's wife, we can hope that they spared the children. Maybe his body and a load of supplies would have kept his family alive and safe in the shelter. Second, you may be wondering how we know the name of the last mayor of Boston. It has a strange source. When wandering the streets of Boston, one might come across the Boston Public Library. The boarded up structure has two entrances, one on the west side and one in the Copley MBTA station. When attempting to gain entry, the sole survivor can pick the door's lock or talk to the automated intercom. If, when talking to the intercom, the sole survivor replies that they are a city employee, the intercom will then ask for their ID number. Giving the number 123456 will lead the intercom to welcome the sole survivor as the mayor. When entering the site again, the intercom will welcome the sole survivor as Mr. Hildenbrand. So there you go, if you were wondering. Third. The exterior of the Boston Mayoral Shelter is strange for a few reasons. Let's start with the fact that there is a massive security booth with skeletons of a guard and two scientists within. Compare this booth to the entrance of Vault 111, Vault 94, and even just the Free State's bunkers. Why is the booth so large and what's up with the lab-coated skeletons? Beyond this, there is only one truck and a front loader. Where are the cars? How did the mayor and his family and staff get to the bunker after the bombs? From what I could find, in the real world there is no official residence for the mayor of Boston. They typically stay within their own house. We don't know if this was the case in the Fallout universe, but assuming that it was and that the mayor lived on the outskirts of Boston itself, the shelter still lies just outside of Natick, which is about 15 miles from the heart of Boston. Even West Roxbury, which appears to be the closest neighborhood of Boston to Natick, is still almost 10 miles away. That's a long trip on foot with kids and a baby in the aftermath of a nuclear strike. My best assumption for the absence of cars is that the mayor had an advanced warning and that his family and staff drove to the site 10 to 15 minutes before the public was aware. That potentially covers how the family and staff got there. As for where the vehicles are now, it could be that in the aftermath of the siege, the attackers got them running again and fled the site. But both points are just speculation. Fourth, the brick columns section of the shelter is odd. It looks far older than the rest of the shelter and is reminiscent of the sewer tunnels and basements of Boston. There's no obvious reason as to why this section of the shelter exists, so we're left to speculate. I have to assume that prior to the construction of the Boston Mayoral Shelter, there was some facility built on this site centuries prior to the construction of the bunker. Fifth, for my count, there were at least 14 members of staff, including two scientists and 11 guards. There are three bedrooms in the shelter. One is clearly meant for the mayor, his wife, and their baby. One seems meant for their older children, and one appears to have been for the staff. There are only four beds in the staff bedroom. I guess we can assume that they were meant to sleep in shifts, but this seems like a recipe for mutiny. Why would the staff subject themselves to worse conditions than the mayor's family long term, given that the city he was mayor of had ceased to exist? His one claim to power would fade rapidly in the aftermath as the city fell to ruin. The only guess I have as to why so little real estate was left to the staff was that the mayor assumed that the federal government would pick up the pieces and that the shelter would be only a relatively temporary abode. Sixth, the escape tunnel is fairly useless. Its back door, presumably the door one would enter when trying to escape the bunker, is just off the rec room. The front door, through which one would emerge, lies in the small room just off the elevator. This means that, when escaping, you would still have to use the elevator to get out. In either a structural failure scenario or an attack scenario, this isn't ideal. 
There are two skeletons in this tunnel, but other than the fact that they're wearing civilian clothing, there's no clue as to who they were. Alright, I think that'll do it for the story of what happened at the Boston Mayoral Shelter. Follow me on Twitter for lore video announcements at Gaming with Maps. My Discord's open to the public, there's a link in the channel's banner. If you're interested in discussing Fallout lore, want announcements on upcoming content, would like to vote on my next lore video, or make requests, come on by. I've started streaming every Friday evening on YouTube, come check it out if you're interested. If you appreciate what I do here and you want to support the channel financially, you can become a patron with Patreon. I want to thank my patrons Mesothelioma, 76 of Texas, Dark Malcontent, Real76, Dr. Orion, Samsung Smart Fridge, Night Spearhead, and Ahotep for their support. This has been the Irresolute Cartographer. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again next time.